Dadhood. Modern Dadhood Podcast. <laughs> okay. Oh. Did I scare you? Yeah. Caught you off guard? Yeah. Should we introduce the show? Yeah. Have at it, man. Okay. Welcome back. This is Modern Dadhood, an ongoing conversation about the joys, challenges, and general insanity of being a dad in this moment. My name is Mark Checkett, and I am a dad of twin boy toddlers. And who am I looking at? Through Zoom, the computer Through screen, Zoom. you're looking at me. My name is Adam Flaherty. I am a father of two daughters who are six and three. And we like to remind you that we are not experts. We are not experts. We are run-of-the-mill average dads. 100%. Maybe above average in some ways. You are. And lacking in some ways, too. Also you. (laughs) Modern Dadhood is an interview show where we bring in dad guests and talk about dad topics. The good, bad, and the fugly. That's right. And today we welcome John LaCaire, who is not only a father of one seven-year-old daughter, he also happens to be a high school teacher. Isn't that something? Yeah, he's experiencing this whole thing in two very different ways. Yes. Two ways that I am very eager to talk to him about because um, I am, I don't have kids in school, so I don't have to deal with this, this stuff quite yet. Where are you and Jamie at with the boys? They've returned to a daycare facility, right? Yeah, that's correct. They're back at daycare. They go, uh, it's five days a week, kind of a full day. I mean, full for them, you know, they're there from like nine to four thirty or so. It was a tough decision. It was a very hard decision to send them back. Um, I think my wife and I are fortunate because we both work from home. So we are, we are not out in the world seeing anybody else. And so we're at least still limiting our contact with other people as best we can. We started to really see a need for them to uh, experience more than what we could give them within the walls of our own home. Mm -hmm. And they, it was like, it was kind of like a switch. They started acting pretty differently once they went back in a positive way. I was going to say different good or different bad. (laughs) Different, different good. Yeah. No, all of a sudden they were assholes. (laughs) No, they, it was, um, it was mostly positive. Um, what's new in your world, man? Yeah. What's going on with us is just what so many other parents are dealing with at this exact moment, which is the insanity of this whole back to school thing and trying to figure out what the hell we're going to do and what is right for our kids and our family. And this is nobody's been through something like this before, whether it's the families or the, the school administration, you know, the faculty, Mm. everybody's figuring this out as they go. And so it was only a week, two weeks ago that the school district where we live started rolling out their plan for the fall and their plan for the fall for kindergarten through fourth grade looks a lot different than their plan for the fall for fifth grade through 12th grade. And they have decided that for kindergarten through fourth grade, the kids will be going back to school five days a week minus like half a day on Wednesday. You can opt for a remote option, a fully remote option, or you can take your kid out of the school system and essentially homeschool. And where we're at is that my younger daughter was in a nature-based preschool that we loved that is not opening back up for a number of reasons in the fall. And Mm. And your older daughter went through the same thing. She did. We we really loved it. They spent most of their time outside. It was just really great for both of them. But the young woman who was running that school is now starting her own outdoor nature-based preschool program. Much of the same philosophy that the school had. Now it's her thing sort of on her terms. And we, Hmm. we love her. She's fantastic. The staff from the school is fantastic and she's brought most of them with her. And so now she's scrambling, you know, in, in Hmm. for the last two weeks and the next two weeks to pull this together and to create this organization and to just deal with all the logistics of setting up a business. And we know it'll be great for our three-year-old. What we're exploring now 
is if our six-year-old going into second grade can also be there in that same little campus. And if we can hire a private instructor to follow a curriculum that we will license with, yeah. a, with a small group, a small cohort of other students. That's what makes sense for us. We feel good about the decision at every quarter of the school year. So every nine weeks or so, we will have the option to move our older daughter back into the school system if we want to. And that is just going to sort of depend on on the numbers and what the virus looks like then. Um, We would love to get her back into the school system as soon as possible. But we're just thrilled that it seems to be shaking out that she'll be able to go to the same place as our younger daughter, spend most of their days outside and still get an education at the same time. That's amazing. We have lots of friends who are sending their kids back into the school building and, you know, have no judgment at all towards that approach and just sort of understand that everybody has to do what's right for their family and There are many different variables that go into that for families. You know, it can Mm -hmm. be scheduling. It can be their comfort level with safety. It can be the socialization piece. There's so many different variables that could go into that decision. Yeah. I was just thinking of this meme I saw the other day that was like, it was like the correct answer to the following questions. And it was like, uh, or to the following statements. And one was like, I'm sending my kid back to school. And the other one was like, we're doing remote learning. And the other one was like, we're going to homeschool our kids. And it was like all the exact same answer yeah. or response to those, which is like, good job. What it's a tough decision that you have to yeah. go through right now, you know? Exactly. Um, and that's, it's, it's right. It's, I mean, everybody's gosh, kids learn differently, you know, from one another. Parents have different situations. Uh, parents have different job things to consider. I mean, there's just so many variables and it's just a new territory. Anybody can be like, all right, hang on a second. We've, we've all been through this before. Let me just pull out the playbook from the last time we ran this. And that just doesn't exist. And I feel like there's still so much that's unknown about the virus too. It, It feels like this is something we've all been enduring for some time. And it has, I mean, you know, depending on your perspective, I suppose it has been a while. It's been months, Yep. you know, thinking back to February of this year. I mean, my gosh, we're going into the fall, you know, there is so much that is unknown and all we've experienced of this virus, we haven't experienced it in the fall. We haven't experienced it in the winter, you know? So the, there are still huge chunks of time that we have we just don't know because we haven't experienced it with this particular virus and, and, you know, this particular circumstance yet. Well, as we approach the fall and the return to school, we thought it would be interesting and insightful to hear from a high school teacher about how his district is handling the return to school. And at the same time, how that either jives or clashes with he and his wife's personal plans for their own daughter, who's going to be going into second grade. So John LaCaire, a personal friend of mine, welcome to Modern Dadhood. No, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. This show has been fun because it's allowed us to have really great conversations with um, people who we don't know, but also when it is appropriate and fitting to welcome friends onto the show, too. And Mark and I have both had a chance to bring in people who have a relevance to the topic we're talking about. And you popped right into my head when we started thinking about this whole sort of back to school conversation, because like I said when I was introducing you, you've got the perspective of a high school teacher who's going back into a school building that will look totally different than when you left it. And also your daughter Zoe is going into second grade and I would love to hear about your, your plans for her. But first tell us a little bit about your family. Yeah. So uh, my wife, Lindsay is also a high school teacher. She teaches science uh, down in Massachusetts, which adds a different dichotomy because I'm, I'm a high school teacher in New Hampshire. And then there's differences there with this whole COVID thing. And our daughter, uh, Zoe, she just turned seven uh, in July, you know, as energetic and opinionated as her uh, parents. Uh, so that's been fun. But yeah, uh, so it's the three of us and um, which has been interesting because, you know, for her, she's been around a lot of adults. She doesn't have a sibling. And, and uh, I know you guys have talked about in prior episodes, you know, that being careful of, you know, how you represent yourself and, and what you think and how what you wear on your faces uh, as far as, you know, um, not scaring them, but wanting them to be informed. And so she's 
she's quite aware. Um, but at the same time, I don't think scared. I, I don't think she'll be, at least I hope, not any long-term negative impacts on her as far as that goes. I just found out, uh, John, that you are a high school government teacher. And we were talking a little bit before you hopped on. What a wild time to be a government teacher, first of all. And we don't we don't have to go uh, <laughs> down that road. Maybe we'll save that for a bit uh, for a different podcast. But can you paint us a little bit of a picture? What March of 2020 looked like in your high school? Yeah, I mean, we were, um, you know, business as usual right up until I was, uh, March 12th. And then um, literally, I, I, it's, it's one of those moments, you know, how September 11th is, you know, you live through it, you remember everything. I, I, it's going to be one of those moments in my school that was kind of pre-COVID and, and post. And yeah. we all remember exactly where we were on March 13th, that Friday. We, I was actually, I, I do the faculty play. And so we, a bunch of teachers were, who were in the play, stayed after school that day to practice the play and uh, that was coming up in May. And we got an email from our headmaster that afternoon. We had, we had said goodbye to the kids. You know, everybody, they had assignments due Monday. Everything was normal. Nobody packed up classrooms. But we got an email that afternoon at like five o'clock saying, you're not coming back into school on Monday. Get ready hmm. to teach these kids remotely. And so, uh, you know, we had maybe two or three days lead time as teachers to get our lessons all converted into somehow uh, being able to, t- to teach them virtually. We really rose to the occasion. I was, I was quite proud of us because it was a lot <laughs> and, and it was a lot on the kids. It was a lot. Of, you're going through your own fears. I mean, we, we were scared, you know, we're not going to hide that. And uh, you know, and you, your, your family, and, and then you're still supposed to be rising to the occasion for your job. So it, it was surreal. The whole thing was a whirlwind, you know? Did the school system give you a period of time that you were going to be remote? Did they say, we're going to do this for two weeks and then reassess? Or was it like right then they kind of called it for the rest of the year? Yeah, no, it, it was, it was um, pretty much week by week. Uh, you know, I think in the, in the back of our minds, a lot of us knew that it probably, I mean, you could see the news, right? It wasn't, it certainly wasn't getting seemingly better day to day, but I, I think, you know, as humans, we kind of hold out hope and, you know, most of us uh, as teachers, um, the best part of our job is actually the classroom time. That it kind of robbed us of that. Uh, so for a lot of us, you know, I'll tell you, I mean, as remote, you work longer hours. It's it's harder to break between family and, and your job, and uh, it was the hardest I've ever worked. So I just wish there was a little bit more understanding that remote is not a vacation. It's not getting more time. It's so people, the teachers aren't saying it for that. They're they're saying it for their own health, but also the health of their students and just this realization that. You know, if it can be done, especially, I, I guess I should talk for the high school age, right? The high schoolers can stay home alone. The issue here a lot is daycare, right? Well, the kids, the elementary school, for the economy to come back, it has to be daycare. We need these schools open. And, and that's tough to hear as a teacher, especially a high school teacher, because that's not the reason to, to justify it. You know, it should be backed by science and, and things like that. So you're hearing more and more that kids, even young kids, are getting sick. I mean, that's why I'm keeping my second grader out. I think if you talk to us in March or April, right, the, the general consensus was that kids were vulnerable. You know, they, they weren't vulnerable, I should say. They were immune. To right. the um, and that's kind of slowly been proven not to be true as we learn more about it. So it's just the unknowns. And we, we work so hard for five months. Why kind of throw it away just because the calendar says it's September and that's when we should be in school. So I just wish there was a little bit more understanding of what remote really was yeah. Anyway, going back to your question, it was it was uh, week to week, um, but then it, it got to be about mid April, and I, I we kind of knew we were going to do this through June. Suddenly, you're thrust into this remote learning atmosphere. You know, a couple months go by, March, April, May. How are you finding it? Trying to hold students' attention and hold them accountable, and and. And all of that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and that, it was something we were figuring out as we went along, you know, and not to toot my own horn, but th- those teachers who, who really take the time um, to develop a culture with their classroom and get to know their kids and, and develop a bond uh, more so that they want to work for you. Those classes did better than the ones that didn't or, or that maybe don't quite have that as their strength. So I was able to kind of hold on to them. And um, But you, you did. You saw a trail off and, um, you know, you, you would have Zoom. And the kids, we had very high expectations. I, I will say my school, New Hampshire, and particularly my school, and these grades were going to impact their GPA. And, uh, you know, we didn't reduce the rigor, you know, really. And most of these parents were still working. So these kids were all of a sudden at home, kind of in a college-like atmosphere where there's nobody really 
watching mm-hmm. if you're doing your schoolwork. And right. uh, it was very easy for people to drop off, which was scary. That's why we, we were very fearful of um, just huge, like MIA, just huge failure rates um, happening. And the kids really thrived. They, they really craved actually teachers who were doing more live Zooms, right? Or even live notes rather than record a video and play it for them and just tell them to watch it. And I'll be here if you need me, you know, text or email me. So much of what we do is is based on that connection, that bond, that, that being face to face. So it, it was surreal in that, in that way. Now, speaking of parents who are still working, you are a family of three with two full-time teaching parents. What did that look like for you guys when suddenly Zoe was home trying to follow a first grade curriculum while you both were trying to teach your students full time. Yeah, it was uh, it was incredibly challenging. I mean, we'll be on it. You know, we, we like to talk about, oh, so much. It was so great having family time. And, and it certainly was. But, uh, you know, not to kind of ignore the, the challenges, of course. I mean, there were days where, you know, I had a, a class and, um, you know, we were expected to teach on a, a schedule. So, you know, if you had an 8 a.m. to 930, that was what, you know, you were doing with your kid. So I would have to be doing that. And, and there were times where my wife's uh, schedule overlapped and we both have to be committed to our students while, you know, my daughter is looking for help signing on to her Google Meet. So uh, it, it was challenging. I mean, um, it took us a couple of weeks to really get into a groove where we knew, all right, well, you're going to be up in the office, uh, maybe on the computer. Uh, Lindsay will be down here at the kitchen and Zoe will be, we'll, we'll set her up for the living room and kind of all be able to do our own things uh, and just find out that schedule that worked. Absolutely. So then we moved into summertime. Everybody had different assumptions about what the fall was going to look like. I think a lot of us thought that things would have cleared up by now, but here we are in the end of August, all scrambling to make plans that are right for our family and based on a number of different things. There's obviously a lot of controversy around the return to school. And I'd like to hear about that from both the perspective of a teacher and of a dad. So let's start with a dad. Zoe is going into second grade. In her school district, what does reopening look like? Her district, uh, by a 3-2 vote, decided to do hybrid. But they also gave the option for full remote for students. So, And what are your plans for her going to be? Are you going to send her into the building or are you going to, will you keep her out and do remote? Um, yeah, so it was, it was getting down to crunch when, uh, you know, our hearts sank. I mean, my, my wife took it really hard when that decision was made with the school committee, especially where, because it had looked leading up to it, that they had the numbers to go full remote. Uh, and then somebody changed at the very last second, they were kind of persuaded in the very last meeting. So we went from kind of being like, we don't need to scramble. We're, we're one of the fortunate ones that we're not trying to figure it out because my wife's going to be home with her and it'll be fine. Uh, and so that really threw a monkey wrench at us that we, we weren't thinking was going to be the case. So Knowing what we know, my wife's being a science teacher, me reading too much about it this summer, um, it just, for me, us, it doesn't feel safe, especially at her age, to, to put her back in there. So luckily, my uh, mother-in-law is uh, being very courageous, quite frankly, uh, um, and she's uh, agreed to be home with her and, and let us um, take her to her house, and she will do the remote teaching with her so that my wife and I can go to school. But it's a huge huge. Uh, we're, we're indebted to her because without that, I don't know what we would have done. So you're a teacher of high school students, ninth grade, and sort of as we understand it, kids of that age, and of course, adults and older um, have a higher likelihood of contracting and transmitting this virus. So what kind of plans does your school have for the reopening? Can you kind of talk a little bit about maybe what some of the safety protocols are? are, are going to be like? Yeah, sure. Um, the big thing that I think uh, for my school, the push to reopen, we are doing a, a hybrid model. The big thing was this, this culture I talked about, right? In March, when we went remote, even, even those of us, my, my course is a semester course, so it's only a half year, but I had met those students in late January. So I had a good six weeks to establish a classroom culture, that, that bond. If we had gone straight remote, right, the argument is that you don't get that with these kids. And then how are you supposed to, you know, you've never met face to face, but you know, here they are enrolled in this virtual classroom with you. Right. And they're not college kids. So, so how was that going to be? Right. And, and did every kid have a one-to-one computer? We, we need to get those in the hands of these kids. So I think a lot of those, that reasoning went into our decision, you know, again, 
is remote probably the better choice? I, I, I'd say that just as a blanket statement, um, not against my school. Most schools aren't doing remote, but you know, based on what I know, I, I think that's the safest route. Um, having said that, the, they are taking a lot of precautions. One of the things our teachers felt very strongly about was that we had to mandate masks. The distancing is happening. So in my classroom, um, I, I generally have 30 desks. Uh, my classroom today had 12. It's bizarre to walk in there. Uh, it's very bare bones. They're putting partitions up, uh, you know, for the assistants in the main office. You know, they're, they're separating out that where they can. They're changing walking path directions and making it one way or this way. Hand sanitizer stations going up, Clorox wipes. Lunchtime is going to be kids sitting at isolated desks spread throughout a cafeteria. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're trying to do, they're, they're following the CDC guidelines. They're trying to do everything possible. I, I will give them that. Um, still, you're, you're inside a room, right? You're, you're breathing air. And I mean, I, everybody's crossing our fingers that it will work. You know, I'm trying to imagine myself back in high school and the things that I cared about and, and how hard already it was for me to stay focused in classes. Adam and I were talking about the social aspect of school and how important that is to you when you're in that moment, ninth grade, 10th grade. I mean, there's a big social aspect to your, to your life and it revolves largely around school. And I just wonder how, you know, how difficult it must be for kids to not just focus on this, all this weird new stuff that's happening and and just the virus and this pandemic. I mean, I know that it commandeers half of my day every day and I'm a grown up working at, at home, you know, gosh, it just must be, it just must be such a difficult, I would say adjustment, but it's like longer than an adjustment. Right. No. And, and uh, you're hitting the nail on the head. I mean, I can't tell you how many conversations I had just today with fellow teachers that, cause we were, we were asking our admins about the numbers, you know, because our, our students do have the choice to stay fully remote if they want to. So we're, we're a school of 3,300 students and only 13% so about 384 kids have decided to stay full remote. And as teachers, though, we said that didn't surprise us, right? Because they're craving that social. They're cra- they want to come back and see their friends. But what we are anticipating is that they're going to see what those classrooms look like. They're going to see the teachers in our masks, in our face shields, some of which are wearing <laughs> scrubs. I mean, you talk yeah. about just a wow. bizarro kind of dystopian world. Look, right? I mean, lunch, not with your friends, but sitting by yourself in a desk. So a lot of those social things are not coming back with them coming back. So we actually expect to seeing a huge influx in, in kids who go remote because they're going to see what it's like. And, and probably not, why would, why would you get up early to, and risk your health to come into that? You know, so we'll, we'll see. Are there any other issues that are weighing heavily, you know, or particularly controversial as a high school teacher that that we might not be thinking of or some, anybody who's not a high school teacher might not consider? Um, there's just, I mean, I, I'm somebody who feels pretty strongly about the remote, right? But I, but I do sympathize and empathize with the, you know, I, I understand that, you know, there's certain populations within our school that really, they almost have to have that one on right, right? Our special ed program, for example, or, you know, those, those kids need to be in school somehow. So how can we make that possible? But, you know, maybe keep the vast majority of, people safe too. Um, you know, our, our, our trade, our skills, people, right. Uh, CTE programs, those are hands-on things. Uh, yeah. Even my wife teaching a science class, I have it pretty easy in social studies. I, I can adapt most of my lessons to virtual, you know, uh, Lindsay's losing, um, the hands-on labs or, or they have to get real creative with how they're going to do it. So there's a lot of challenges like that, that, you know, it's just, uh, we're going to have to figure it out as we go. I mean, you can't really sit here and plan it out because we don't know what it's going to look like when the kids are actually in the classrooms yet. That's an interesting thing. So as teachers get creative with how they're going to do things that used to be hands-on experiences, what about things that would require delivering or shipping things to students is there budget for that or are those conversations just had on a case by case basis? Yeah. I mean, uh, that came up today too, cause we were talking about, you know, we're setting up our classrooms, right. And, uh, you know, we do a lot of in class work where we have, you know, our boxes of, uh, crayons and, and colored pencils for the kids and all these things that you share, right. And a lot of kids touch in any given day, uh, especially if you're working on a project in class and we were talking, well, we, we, we're not going to put those out. Right. So we're going to have to ask the kids to, to supply them themselves. But then you come up against, you know, we have a significant part of our population that that, that really will be a hardship 
So then, you know, do we ask for it to be bought for us or do the teachers just try to bridge that gap? So yeah, that, that's certainly, I mean, there's teachers who are saying we're not going to collect any paperwork. I don't want to touch their stuff. We're not. So everything is going to have to be some type of you, you're handing it in virtually. I, I don't really prefer that. Um, I, I think that touching transmission is really not our chief concern. I think it's aerosols and not that I'm a doctor or scientist, but the touching, I'm not too worried about. So if I, I could see myself collecting work, but there's some teachers who are just, they're not going to do that. And uh, they've made that choice. I'm just thinking too, you, you had mentioned you were on the, uh, like a teacher's theater group. Is uh, that yeah. The, the faculty play. Yeah. So much of the, I feel like, I don't know, national discussion maybe as, as it pertains to like extracurricular activities is so centered around sports, but there are plenty of kids who are facing like exactly what you went through with the faculty theater group. It's a shame that, you know, you're probably having groups like that that are being disbanded or, you know, I feel like arts is often a place Mm -hmm. that gets sort of put on the chopping block as it is. That must be a difficult predicament to think through. How do you supplement that in, in times of remote learning? Yeah, it is. It is worrisome because for a lot of those kids, that's the only outlet they have, you know, and and that's um, I'm going to go off on a tangent, but that's part of also what kind of goes into the decision making about whether to be in school or not, because you have populations that, you know, being home is is not actually the best thing for them. We have kids who rely on us to feed them. Uh, so again, uh, kind of going into that thought process, but you know, at my freshman orientation day, we, we held it and, uh, I, I worked outside and I saw the band, uh, kids were doing their kid. They were outside in a field. Normally they'd be inside, but, the, but right now the weather is nice too. And, and I think that's, as the weather starts to shift, I, it's going to get harder and harder for some of these things to actually go forward. But yeah, you had theater groups, uh, you know, the big spring musical that they were working on kind of got ripped out from under them. And, and tentatively right now, we even have um, a prom from last year is tentatively scheduled for this fall to see if we can do it. Hmm. You know, so they're, they're, they're trying. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, a lot of these experiences, these defining experiences for these students uh, have been taken away. So it's kind of one of those things that's not fair to, to anybody, you know. Well, we wish you... Lindsay, Zoe, nothing but the best. And we'll be thinking about you. And it's been a real pleasure having you on Modern Dadhood. You guys as well. I hope your families uh, take care and, uh, you know, everything works out for how you want it to work out, you know, as we go forward here. Thanks, John. I do believe it's time for another installment of Did I Just Say That Out Loud? Thank you, Carl Castle. I think I'm getting better at it. Yeah. I hope I'm getting better at it. What you got? I have one. And as per usual, I'm going to say it and then I'm just going to pause and I'm going to let, I'm going to let you imagine the scenario. I love it. Okay, go. Okay. Here's what I said. Don't do it from the bottom. Do it from the top and spin. Don't do it from the bottom. Do it from the top and spin. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I said. I know you're potty training, but I can't <laughs> picture what that would be. Spin is the thing. That's I'm, I'm visualizing spinning things in my mind. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is it something spinning in one of their hands? <gasps> is it their full body spinning? Hmm. Could it be like a fishing pole, like reeling? Not bad. I don't know. I love, wa- I love watching <laughs> Adam's brain work. I, there's some steam. There's some <laughs> steam. Um, well, uh, I give up. I'll just I give up. I'll just come right out and say it. We were eating ice cream cones. Oh, okay. And I have I have one son who will from top to bottom just lick, 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 and just and then when he gets to the cone, he just eats it. And I have another son who's very leery around the cone itself. He's not a hundred percent sure where he should start and where it should end. And he's started kind of like licking a little, but then he'll, he just kind of gets curious about the bottom of it and will just go at it, eating at it. And uh, there's been a couple of occasions where he's eaten a bunch of the bottom and then it melts and drips. Of course, it gets and then messy. he's all upset that there is just ice cream, just, just streaming out onto his lap and his, his hands and everything. And so I've been trying to direct them to start, you know, from the top of it. And the other thing that they're not understanding is that they take their time and ice cream melts. And so it's a race against time a lot of the time. And so 
a method that I employ is the is the sort of tongue out spin. Take take the cone and <laughs> spin it around so that way you're kind of you're enjoying it, but you're also just routinely cleaning up that r- that <laughs> rim of the of the cone to keep the drips from really. And so I kind of yelled out like uh, he was kind of licking and eating at the bottom. I said, "Don't do it from the bottom. Do it from the top and spin, spin it." Yeah. What flavor? Uh, we were, we had we were eating at the time. It was like a peanut butter fudge thing. Perfect. We keep trying. We keep just like every grocery store trip. We're just getting like another flavor, seeing what they love and seeing what they hate. Well, there you have it. Spins us right into the outro. <laughs> That's right. Uh-huh. Dads, you can find us at moderndadhood.com on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the rest of them. Mm-hmm. All of them. All of them. Please consider hitting that little subscribe button if you haven't. And it actually only takes less than a minute to leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. And I'll tell you, it is so appreciated. I mean, Adam, I've left reviews and it's taken me 10 seconds. You've left them under many different names, haven't you? Yeah. Why do you think we have so many reviews? (laughs) Hey, you could also drop us a line at hey at moderndadhood.com. And you could write in and you could say, we love X about the show and we hate Adam about the show. Well played, sir. Yeah. Zing. Thank you to Casper Baby Pants and Spencer Albee for our Modern Dadhood music and to Pete Morse at Red Vault Audio for his impeccable mixing skills and as we always say to close out the show thank you for listening my mouth did could you tell you